All right. Good morning. This is Brother Brandon Teague, and you're in the services of Faith Baptist Church, and we are coming to you from northeast Texas, south of Deport, Texas, and we are glad to be coming to you. And uh, we hope that you've tuned in to hear from God this morning because that's our desire is to preach the Word of God and set forth the Word of God and let Him have His way in your life. So if, if you, and this morning happens to be part 146 of a sermon series entitled Getting to Know Jesus. And the reason for this sermon series is because I have felt for a long time that many, many people, they have a basic knowledge of Jesus, but they don't have a working daily relationship knowledge of Jesus. So many people that go to church, so many people who claim to be believers, they don't have much of a relationship. And, and the purpose is, has been to draw uh, through the preaching of, of, of the Word of God and primarily in the Gospels chronicling the life of the earthly life of Jesus, spending time with him and getting to know him on a personal basis, uh, listening to his words and, and following after him. That's, that's our expectation of this, is to draw us closer. Because, again, unless you spend time with somebody every day, you don't know them. You just don't. You think you do, but you don't. You can't remember the things that they say. You can't remember the things that they've done like you do when you sit next to them daily and you hear from them and you have conversation with them and you get to know their character. And that's what we've been trying to do is to get as close to Jesus as we possibly can because this world and Satan's way uh, of working in this world surely has made its inroads into our life. We can't deny that. Even though we don't want to admit that, there's a television in nearly every living room. There's a phone in nearly every hand. There are, there are billboard advertisements. There are magazines. There, there are many, many, many different ways, computers everywhere. And, and all that information, uh, most of well, I say all of it, but the majority of it comes from worldly humanistic thinking, and it comes into our minds. And we've got to battle that daily by spending time with the Lord. And, and building upon our relationship with him. But let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning before we even begin. And let's ask God to meet with us today. Father, we come before your throne. Lord, we need you today. Father, we pray for the one who's tuned in to hear today from you. And we pray, Lord, they will not be disappointed. We pray, Holy Ghost of God, that you fill me and control me from the top of my head to the sole of my shoes. Lord, I pray today that you would use me for Christ's honor and glory. Lord, that you would use me somehow to be a blessing. Lord, I want to be. I pray, Father, for those who are listening. Lord, those who are here and those who are listening in. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God minister directly to our, to our needs. And, Lord, also uh, convict us, Lord, of our deficiencies when it comes to serving Christ. Lord, I pray for the one who's lost. I pray for the one who's not sure how, how to be saved. Lord, I pray that this be the day they come to realize who Jesus Christ truly is and that he is sent by God the Father to be the gift, to be the sacrifice, to be the payment, to be their redeemer, to pay the price for their sins, the gift of God. Lord, may they receive it, believe, and be born again. Father, this is our prayer today. Lord, I pray you touch each one of us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 21 this morning, Matthew 21, and uh, we, are, we are now looking at, and we're in the last week of the life, earthly life of Jesus Christ, not the life of Jesus Christ, his, his life is eternal, he, he's always existed and he always will, but in his earthly life, in the body that, that the Holy Ghost of God placed him into, uh, it's, it's that, that life we're looking at, and again, He's going to the cross on Wednesday. Today is Monday in our message. And Monday's going to last a while. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We won't finish it all this morning, but, but it's Monday. On, on Saturday, Jesus has left Bethany, and the 1.6-mile procession begins to Jerusalem, down into the city of Jerusalem and down to the temple. Jesus is riding upon the foal of an ass. He's got, it's covered in, 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 in coats, and he's sitting upon it. And people are running before him, and they believe with everything in them, having heard all of his teaching, having seen his miracles, 
They believe with everything in them that he is coming now into the temple and he is there going to establish his kingdom, his, his earthly kingdom. They believe that he will then reveal himself as the Messiah and he will put down the enemies of God and Israel will rule and be the center point of the world. I mean, that's, that's their belief at, at that time. And so I want you to understand something. When they're shouting Hosanna, uh, what they're saying is, is they're saying, save us. Save us, thou son of David, Messiah. Messiah, save us. That's what they're shouting when they're saying, Hosanna, thou son of David. Okay? So I want you to understand, <clears throat> their expectation is a lot different from what they got. And, uh, and, and I know we know that, but I just want to refresh people's minds of that. So <clears throat> Jesus has come into the temple, and he has, he has done some things there. He, he came in. He, he came to the tables of the money changers. He turned them over. He dumped out their coins. He took the, those who sold animals to the temple. He, he loosed a bunch of turtle doves, doves flying everywhere. He, he's driving them out of the temple. For the second time in his ministry, he's driving these people out of the temple. And, and, and that's, that's, that's the things leading up to what we're looking at today. But, I want, but before we get into that and get any further, I want, I want to establish some things first of all. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and read in our, in our text. Let's go ahead and read verse 23 through 32, Matthew chapter 21, verse 23 through 32. The Bible says, And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, then he will say unto us, Why did you not then believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whither of thee, them twain, whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards, that you might believe him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray this morning again for Holy Ghost power. I pray, Lord, that you fix our hearts and minds upon the message today. Lord, don't let our mind drift and wander. I pray, Lord, that we come with the reverence and the fear of God that we ought to come with. Lord, that we understand we're at the throne of Almighty God. May we come... Lord, humbly seeking to hear from you, to have a touch from your li uh, in our life from your hand today. Father, I pray today for Holy Ghost power, please. Please steady my thoughts. Help me now. I want to be used of thee. Speak to each one of us today, please, Lord. We, we, we pray and we ask now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> the first thing I want us to look at, and the whole, the the whole, the central thought in this message today is one word: it's authority. That's all. That's that's the central message of this: is authority. And I, w I want us to think just for a minute, and I want you to understand something about the, the day that Jesus lived in. Jesus lived in a very authoritative, authoritarian society. 
Israel was under the authority of Rome, and Rome was limiting Israel in the way that it conducted itself. They didn't totally control them, but they certainly had power over Israel. And Israel was an oppressed society because of it. And that authority was handed down. It was delegated. And authority was respected, and authority was obeyed. And you remember just a couple weeks ago where, the, you know, the, the, the Bible tells us some of the chief priests believed Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, but they didn't, they didn't make it public. They didn't confess Christ. Why? Because they feared, they feared the Jews. They feared being put out of the synagogue. They'd already been told, you know, you support him, basically. We'll put you out of the synagogue. And if they were put out of the synagogue, they, they lost their standing in society. They lost uh, their family, their friends, their contacts, everybody that meant anything to them shunned them. <coughs> so the, the society had the authority to do that. If it was delegated to them, that's what they were to do. Okay? So, again, whatever was said by the higher-ups, that's what the underlings followed. The Pharisees had authority but not like the high priest, not like the chief priests and the elders. They had more authority than the Pharisees. The Pharisees came after Jesus time and time and time again. But this is a little bit different here today, what we're looking at. And now understand that the high priest, the chief priests, and the elders, they were authority. They were the powerful authority in Israel, but they served under Rome's authority. It was delegated to them. And they couldn't do anything they wanted to do without Rome's approval. They had to have the approval of Caesar in order to do what they did. So these men, the, the high priests, the chief priests, the elders, they had an understanding of authority. They understood, and they understood God's word well enough to know that God was the ultimate authority and that God delegated that authority. And so... They felt as though that they were God's representatives on the earth. Here they are. They're in charge of God's temple. So they felt like, hey, this is our, this is our responsibility. This is our domain. This is, this is, we have the authority here. And now we find ourselves on Monday. Since Saturday... Again, Jesus entered, entered the city to shouts of Hosanna, Son of David, save us, Messiah, save us. What else did he do? He came into the temple. He looked around in, in his father's house, and he saw the corruption that was everywhere where they were making merchandise out of the house of prayer. They were ripping people off. They were taking advantage of people coming from other countries with foreign currencies and they would, they would absolutely take advantage of them in the exchange rate and give them less than they gave them. They were making merchandise of the people. Those who came and didn't, weren't able to carry animals from far distances, they had to buy those animals, but rather than have a shop down the street or a cattle lot or a, or a sheep lot or, or a, a place that sold doves, no, what did they do? They set up right there in the temple and made it a house of merchandise. Corruption. Ripping people off. And what did Jesus do? He came in and in one fell swoop removed all generations of corruption from the temple. He came in to shouts of save us Messiah. He came in to these men's place of authority and he absolutely cleared out all this corruption that had been building up for years and years and years and years, and nobody said a thing. Nobody batted an eye. They saw it as normal. Kind of like our society today we live in. Within our government, within the framework of our government, there is so much corruption that has been allowed to go on for years and years and years and years in our apostate churches. There is so much corruption that has been allowed to go on for years and years and years. I mean, down through the centuries, you think about what, what all is going on in the name of the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, they have murdered believers to the, in, in, the, in the millions. 
I want to say some 50 million during the Dark Ages were murdered at the hands of the Catholic Church. You talk about corruption. I don't have time to go into all that. But I think we know. There's so much corruption in our society. There's so much corruption in our America. And there was so much corruption in the Israel that Jesus was in, in the flesh. And what did he do after he cleansed the temple? He started healing people. He, he, he came in and did the things that God would have him to do in his house. He came in, he started healing people, he's healing blind people, and he begins teaching. And so we find ourselves there in verse 23. And the high priest, the chief priest, and the elders reject him as Messiah. We know that already. We've already looked at that that they would not believe on him, and they rejected him. Verse 23, <coughs> And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching, and said, they, they interrupted him. They, I mean, this is not, excuse us, sir, pardon us, but we have a question. No, they came right up while Jesus is in the midst of teaching. They barged in and they and they cut him off and asked him and said, "By what authority doest thou these things?" They'd had enough. They were they were fed up. They wanted to do something about what Jesus was doing. Understand that these are evil men. They've been they've been sitting around with their hands tied trying to figure out how to rid themselves of this Jesus who's come in and upset their apple cart. I mean, he's, he's, he's come in and undone all the things that they had going on. I mean, they came in and they asked him two questions. They said, By what authority doest thou, dost, doest thou these things? And the second question, Who gave thee this authority? See, that's really what it's all about in this world, is authority. Can I say to you that in the early days of this country, when the colonial, when the, when the, when the, when the colonists were, were establishing their territories and states in this, in this nation, where people came from, from uh, uh, Europe and they came here in search of a place where they could worship God freely, they wanted to worship God without the, the king of England having say over how they could do it, they, want, they wanted, to, they wanted to, uh, to live in a society freely and worship God according to their own conscience. And what did they do? They came here, and the people that they despised and tried to get away from followed them here, and our Baptist forefathers tried to preach without taking a state license. They tried to preach without the authority of another, uh, the Anglican Church or the, English, uh, the Church of England, and when they tried to, they were, they were despised, they were rejected, they, they were told, you don't have the authority, and they, they were sometimes disenfranchised, which means they couldn't go and buy and sell goods. They had to fend for themselves in the woods or die. They were beaten, they were whipped, they were tied up, they were mocked in this nation. Why? Because they refused to go along with what the authorities said they were to do. They had a higher authority. God Almighty. We've all heard of the book Pilgrim's Progress, written by a man named John Bunyan, who was in the Bedford jail. Why? Because he refused to take a license from the state to preach the gospel. The state has no authority over God. And thus these High priests, the high priests, the chief priests, and the elders had no authority over the Lord Jesus Christ, but yet they thought they did. And so they come at him. Basically, they said to him, if they were walking around today, here's what they'd have said. Who do you think you are? That's what they were saying to Jesus. Who in the world do you think you are coming up into our temple do it, talking about how you're the Messiah and coming in here and, and disrupting our order, coming in here and kicking people out that we've allowed for years and years and years. How dare you, sir? That's basically what they came at Jesus with. 
And what did Jesus say in response? Look at verse 24. Jesus, listen, I'm going to tell you something. Don't argue with Jesus. You try to argue with Jesus, you're going to lose every time. He's the greatest debater that ever was. Amen? Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing. I've got a question for y'all. Which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you what authority I do these things. Okay, that's fair enough. You tell me something, I'll tell you. So, what authority did John the Baptist have? That's his question. That's, that's Jesus' question. What authority did John the Baptist have? The baptism of John. Whence was it? That's what he said. Who gave him authority to go and do the things that he did? What did he do? He went out in the wilderness. He preached in the wilderness. He didn't go ask the chief priest. He didn't go ask the high priest. He didn't check with the elders. He went covered in, covered in camel's hair and, 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 and a leather belt out there standing and, 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 and looking like a wild mountain man out there preaching by the Jordan River and preaching repentance toward God. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what happened? People came in droves. Confessing their sins and being baptized in the Jordan River by John. And Jesus said, who, who, who gave him authority? That's what he's asking. He said, by what, what authority? He said, was it from heaven or was it from men? <clears throat> now, I want, I want us to look at, turn over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. Well, let's, let's refresh our memory. I, and I say, I know you probably know everything that's in this verse of Scripture. I mean, this chapter that I'm about to read from, those sitting in front of me, there may be some out there listening to us who are not as familiar with it, so we're going to look at it and we're going to read, starting in verse 6 of John chapter 1. Who was this? Jesus said, well, uh, how, you know, when John the Baptist came, was his authority from men or was it from God? And here's what it says about John. There was a man sent from God. See that? Whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. In other words, to come to tell folks about Jesus Christ, that all men through him might believe, through Jesus, not John. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Any man who has eternal life, he only gets it from Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own. That's the Jews. And his own received him not, as we see in our text. They're rejecting him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. They believe in his power and his authority and his ability to save. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, this was he of whom I spake. This He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He's given reference to Jesus being eternal, that he's always been. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, and the law could never save, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. Only the begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask of him, Who art thou? And he confessed, and denied not, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elijah? He saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? He answered, no. Then said they unto him, who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou thyself? 
They wanted to know where you come from. Who gave you this? They wanted to know the same thing. Who gave you this authority? And here's what he said. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou beest not that Christ, nor Elijah, nor that prophet? Neither that prophet. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom you know not. He it is whose coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I'm not worthy to unloose. You hear what he's saying about Jesus? The power, the authority that Christ has? John came to prepare the way of the Lord. And Jesus, and, and you see now, John's purpose is being fulfilled here on that Monday as Jesus stands in the temple before the chief priests and the high, uh, high priests and the elders, he stands there proclaiming to them, you remember when he came? You remember what happened? Think on it. He didn't come asking your permission. He just came and did as he was told by the Father. He came and he pointed toward me. That's what Jesus is telling them. Think on that. The Bible says, verse 28, These things were done in Bethbara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptized. And the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. And he kept saying, I know him not, but yet he was his cousin. And he doesn't mean I didn't know him after the flesh. I didn't know he was the Messiah. He said, Upon whom I saw, I, thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. The same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and I bear record that this is the Son of God. Now, that's the testimony of John the Baptist. He came to, to bear witness of Christ. He came in God's authority. He came and he didn't ask permission. And I'm going to say something to you today. You don't need permission from the state to do anything for God. You don't need permit if God if God leads you you don't need man's permission. Now you do need Listen, I'm not saying you don't need to be in a church, you don't need to have some authority in God's house over you so that you don't go and do things your own way as some kind of an outlier and a rebel, but listen to me. You shouldn't go to the government to get your permission. <clears throat> so Jesus speaking on this this subject of authority again. He says to him, well, what, what do you think? Y'all all saw John. Y'all all heard John. You know that John came, and he didn't ask for permission, and all the people went after him. So was it of heaven or was it of men? And they huddled up. And they got in their little group, and they huddled up. And the, and the Bible tells us, well, let's see exactly what it says. They reasoned with themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven... He will say unto us, then why didn't you believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. And, and, and in the other gospel, one of the other gospels, it says that they'll stone us. The people will stone us. You see, the people held John the Baptist as a prophet. After 400 years of silence from God, suddenly here comes John on the scene, and, and it's obvious it's of God. They hold him up as a prophet. So if they were to turn against, if, if these chief priests and, and the high priests and the elders turn against John and they say, oh, no, this was of men, this was, this was all of men, then they were afraid. You know who they remind me of? They remind me of politicians who will say anything they have to to be elected, say anything they have to to stay in power. In other words, they discussed how to respond. 
You know what that means? They don't care about the truth. Let me say to you today, there's a lot of people out there who, who are careful to answer these days. We live in that society of political correctness. Be careful how you answer or you'll be labeled this or you'll be labeled that. I'm going to tell you something. Maybe that's so if you're if you are a, a foul mouth person, you better be careful how you answer in certain situations in certain groups of people. But if, And maybe if you're a racist, you better be careful how you answer in certain situations around certain groups of people. But as a Christian, as a believer, if you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, we're not to be careful how we answer. We're to speak what God lays on our heart. We're to allow the Holy Spirit of God to guide us and to give us what to say. And we're not to fear. Just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego told King Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer thee, O king. Though they knew it might mean that they were cast into that furnace of fire, they were not careful to answer him. They weren't worried about what they said. Why? Because they, they stood on what God had told them. They stood on what they knew of the Lord. Moses and Aaron were not careful to answer Pharaoh when they stood before him. They said exactly what God told them to say. Daniel, much the same way, was not careful to answer. He simply did what God had told him to do. So many men have followed that example. So many have given their lives standing on what's right and standing on the truth and not bending to the authority of this world. Who has authority? Jesus said, all authority, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. John the Baptist had God's authority. These people didn't care how they responded. They just wanted, they, all they cared about was their perceived authority. That's really all they cared about, their power, their position. They didn't care about their eternal soul. They cared about this world and the things of this world. <clears throat> In other words, listen to me, they were their own bosses. God was not their boss. They were. There's so many people in this world today who go around claiming the name of Christ, but yet they are their own boss. They live according to their own rules, not according to God's, but according to theirs. They establish in their own mind, in their own heart, who God is. God is a reflection of their own self, not the Word of God. I'm here to tell you that's why we live today in a nation full of apostate churches. That's why we see society denigrating to the cesspool that it is, is because people have stopped letting God be the authority in their life. Our country, which was founded on God's authority, has thrown that to the side and now worships government itself as God. Jesus said, and they said to him, they said, we can't tell you. We can't tell you. I was reading where a politician was at a pro-life rally. And this politician in his, in his voting record was a, uh, he was pro-choice. And yet when they, when they questioned him and they said, they said, uh, you know, when does life begin? The answer of that politician was this, that's above my pay grade. You know what? That was his way of trying to tell them something that would let him off the hook. That's because in his heart he does not view God as the authority. But he'll say what he has to say not to upset the people and to get elected. That's above my pay grade. But yet when it comes time for that vote, whether to vote for or against, oh, that'll be in his pay grade. So let's, let's turn and look now, verse 28. So Jesus has told them. Jesus told them, you tell me, I'll tell you. They couldn't. So he says, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you what, about what authority I do this. But listen, he, what he does is he turns and he tells, he responds to them in a, in a parable. 
He said, what, what think you? What do you think about this? A certain man had two sons. And he came to the first and he said, son, go work today in my vineyard. Go out there in, my, in, 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 the, in the field, in the vineyard, and whether it's hoeing or whether it's uh, harvesting or whatever it may be, weeding, whatever it was, he wanted him to go and work. And that boy didn't feel like doing it. And he answered him. He said, I, I will not. I'm not going. But afterwards, he repented and went. So afterwards, this first man, he thought about his response to, to his father. He thought about, I guess, he, he, maybe he sat and he mulled it over. And he thought, you know, I wasn't very respectful to my dad. My dad sure has done a lot for me. My dad loves me and he takes care of me. He wants the best for me. Everything he's ever done for me has only been seeking after my good. I need to quit being such a stubborn, hard-headed, rebellious child, and I need to get out there and do what I ought to do. So he repented, you see. What does that mean? He had a total change of mind. He stopped being selfish. He stopped feeling like he was his own boss and realized, no, my father is my boss. He's my authority. And he submitted, he repented, and he went and worked in, in the vineyard. Now, there was the other son. And the Bible says he came to the second, verse 30, and said likewise. He says, son, go work in my vineyard today. And the, he answered and said, I go, sir. And he went not. I'm going. Yet yeah, he found something else to do. Evidently didn't bother him to lie to his dad. Didn't bother him a bit to say, I'll do it. You know what I bet he said? I bet when his father came to him, you know what he said? I was going to. I just about guarantee you, he said, I was going to, but I ran out of time. You know, that's been an excuse all along, ever since the first person was a teenager. I do believe I was going to. And he, Jesus asked these asked these these priests and elders this. He said, whether of them twain, which of the two, did the will of his father? Well, see, they couldn't answer his first question about John the Baptist. But this one they didn't have any problem with. And they said, well, the first. And Jesus said unto them, and why did he say the first? Why? Because he oh, you said, well, wait a minute. He said no at first. Well, let me ask you a question. Weren't we all lost sinners at first? Weren't we all enemies of God at one time? Hadn't we all gone astray like sheep at one time? And then we came to the knowledge of the truth and we realized that God is sovereign, that God is, God is the creator of all things. God is the most powerful force in the entire universe and we realize that he loves us in spite of our sin and he, wants to, he seeks after our good. He wants to do us good all the days of our life. He's prepared for us a home in heaven if we'll simply accept the sacrifice that his son Jesus Christ made for us in taking all of our sin upon himself and dying, being punished in our place upon the cross of Calvary. He took it all. I sang just before we went live on the air the old song, He did it all for me. Each drop of blood he shed for even me. When the Savior cried, bowed his head and died, Oh, praise the Lord. He did it all for me. He is my sovereign. He is my authority. And yes, I looked and I saw that God expected of me more than I could ever do, and I had to throw myself on his mercy. I repented. My way was wrong. My way would send me to hell. My way was leading to destruction, and I had to stop and say, Lord, I'm wrong. Please forgive me. And now I seek to please the Lord. Am I perfect? No. But by God's grace, when I fall down, I get back up and I keep going. Why? Because he's my authority. You see, listen to me. Sin, sin is the rejection of God's authority in your life in favor of your own authority. That person in the mirror becomes your God. 
when you reject God's authority. You don't live in a vacuum. You're going to serve somebody. You're either going to submit yourself and say, Father, I know that I am nothing without you and I need you every decision I make. I need you to be the king over every thought that goes through my mind. I need you to be the driving force behind every action I take. I need you to be <coughs> the lawgiver that I live my life by. And when I refuse those things, and I say, no, I want to do this because I want to, I'm acting just like those chief priests standing there looking at Jesus. You say, you lost if you do it. No, I didn't say I was lost. I said I'm acting like they were. Looking at him as if he has no, no right over my life. So Jesus gives them this to think on and they still can't see it clearly. They know he's talking about them, but they can't see it clearly. Listen, to refuse to obey and then repent and obey. Again, like I said, that's, 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 that's what we are. We're saved sinners. We came into this world lost. We came into this world seeking after our own way, seeking to figure it out on our own. And then we came in contact with the gospel which showed us that we needed to be born again. We needed to be washed clean, made white as snow. And the only thing that would do that is the blood of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and then the second son that he describes, to agree to obey and then to refuse to do it. It represents the religious lost hypocrites who come Sunday after Sunday into places of worship and they sit on pews and they sing songs and they listen to somebody tell them how to be a better person or how to live a good life down here now. And they refuse to tell the truth about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They build for themselves kingdoms here on earth. They take money from people who don't know any better. They think they have it all. <clears throat> Over in James chapter 4, verse 17. James chapter 4, verse 17. Turn over there with me if you would. <clears throat> Lest anyone here or anyone listening should think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. And I don't really know that you're talking to me because I, I do pretty good. Let me explain something to you. James 4.17 says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't do wrong. I, I don't go and do terrible things. I'm a good person. But listen to me. God has put opportunity after opportunity after opportunity in front of you to serve him, to speak, to be a voice for the Lord Jesus Christ, to impact somebody's life for, for God in time and time again because we're too busy with our own little world and our own little things and, and feeding ourselves information that's useless that will never mount us a hill of beans. We waste our time on so many things in this world and we are letting opportunity after opportunity pass right by in front of us and we think we're okay and doing just fine. Him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. He said, well, I'm not doing bad things, but you're not doing good either. You're not useful to God. You're breathing up his air, but you're not doing anything for him. What are you talking about? I'm talking about God wants us to repent of our inaction, the fact that we don't do anything for him, that we are not being useful at all for him. God wants us to repent of it. 
if we're indifferent in our heart toward the things of God, and we're just okay, whatever, blah, blah, blah. We go on through life as if nothing matters. I'm going to tell you something. That's disobedience. Christ says, deny yourself. Take up thy cross and follow me. He doesn't say, get saved, sit down, and swell up like, like, a, like a balloon on your own thoughts and your own feelings. God says, deny yourself. In other words, obey me. Follow me. Quit being your own little idol. Repent of your inaction. Repent of your indifference. It's sin. I say that to believers. I'm telling you this morning, we, we, we are living in the day of apostasy. We're living in the day uh, of just outright wickedness all around us. And if we don't live as believers now, we never will because it's never going to get any better until Christ comes. Today, from today forward, we have an obligation to be the children of God before the sons of men. We have got to live a life that honors Christ. Our lips need to speak things that honors Christ. Our hands need to do things that honors Christ. Our, our, our testimony, our, the things we talk about, we ought to talk to people about Christ. We ought not be bashful about it. We ought, oh, listen, he, I, he wasn't ashamed of me. He was so unashamed of me that he allowed himself to be nailed naked on a cross to bear my shame, to bear my guilt. He took... 39 stripes save one. 39 times nine. You figure it up in your own head or on your own calculator. But that's how many times those tendrils of that cat of nine tails wrapped around his body with, and dug into his flesh and ripped it to shreds for me, for you. His blood rushed out of his body upon the ground. And he carried that wooden cross up that hill being spit on and mocked. He hung there suffering, bleeding and dying, being mocked every moment, laughed at, jeered at. For you, for me, how dare we be indifferent? How dare we? By what authority? Who gives you the right? I thought this morning about my recently deceased friend, Greg Dixon, who back in 2001, after having got under conviction because their church was a 501c3 or whatever it was, it had a tax, it had a, it had a tax uh, number of some sort and he got under conviction because he realized the state ought not have any authority or control over God's house. And he undone all those things and got it separated from that. And the federal government decided, the IRS decided that they owed $5 million or something in, in unpaid income taxes. They renounced their 501c3. They renounced their tax exemption because they, but as they said, God's house is not a legal entity. Listen, what we have here this morning, this is a family reunion. This is a gathering of family. We're not a business. We're here gathering in the name of Christ. And Dr. Dixon stood upon that. <clears throat> and after a standoff of I can't even tell you how many days now, but it was many. Memory, memory fails me for the moment after many other believers gathered with him and stood with him, the government of this country came in with U.S. Marshals and they arrested them and carried them out. And their property was seized. The building of the Indianapolis Baptist Temple, was, which had been there in that spot since 1950, was seized and sold. And from my understanding, there's a liberal arts center sitting on the place right now, on the property right now. That happened in America. And Dr. Dixon would not budge. And he spent his life fighting for God's authority. 
He wrote a book that I read years ago, Authority, the Greatest Thing in the Universe. And really, it comes down to that. Who has the authority in your life? Who is your authority? Who makes your rules? Who do you live by? Do you live by your own set of rules? Do you do things the way you want it done because that's you and that's how you feel about it? Is that your governor, your feelings? Well, that's just the way I was brought up. Is it the way your traditions or the way you were raised? Is that the governor that, that rules over you? Or is it God's word? Is it, is it what the Lord God has told us? Is that, what, is that the, the, the rules that you live by? Who is your authority? That's a question every single one of us need to ask ourselves. Who do I submit to? And do I? I urge you this morning to consider. And if you realize that God's not dictating your life, it's you, then I urge you to repent. I urge you. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't say, I'll do it later. I was going to. I'm going to tell you something. Life's short. It can be over in a snap of the fingers. And then you'll stand before God. And you don't want to stand there and give an account to why he wasn't in control of your life. I'm going to say to you, if you're, if you're lost this morning, come to Christ, submit to him, repent of your sin, turn to him, say, Lord, I, 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 my way is wrong. Lord, I realize you died to cleanse my way, and I, and I believe that you died and that you were buried, but you came out of that grave. I believe you're alive. I believe you're alive forevermore. I believe that you are the Son of God, and I trust you to be my Savior, and I ask you to wash my sins away with your blood. And if you'll do that, friend, he'll save you today. Those words I spoke are not magic words. It's a belief from your heart to God. And if you, you'll throw yourself on his mercy, he will have mercy. I say to every believer listening to me, if you are not giving God his proper place of authority in your life, Turn to him as fast as you can. Repent and ask God to have mercy and forgive you. And, and just like the first son, turn from it and begin to obey immediately. You say, how do I please God from here? Stop doing it your way and turn it over to him and let him have his way. As we sang, would you live for Jesus? And be always pure and good. That doesn't mean you'll always be pure and good. It says, would you? Do you want to? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burdens? Carry all your load? Let him have his way with thee. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart and make you free. His love can fill your soul and you will see what was best for him. Have his way with thee. He is the one in authority. Give him his proper place in your life. Father, we come before you now. Lord, and I, I pray, Lord, that if, if, if their souls, Lord, listen to me and they know in their heart that they've been in the driver's seat for too long, I pray this be the day they let go of the wheel and they let you have your proper place as the driver of their life as the one who guides, the one who steers, the one in control. Lord, I know I've not let you have control of my life as well as I should have over the years, Lord, and I pray that you please, from this point forward, you have control over my life. Lord, I pray that for every one of us who are listening. Lord, I pray that we turn to you and submit and give ourselves over to you and let you have us. Lord, that we might have some impact in this world before it's too late. Father, I just plead with you for lost sinners that they'd come, they'd come to Christ, they'd be born again. Lord, let this be the day of salvation. Lord, may this be the day of restoration to backslidden hearts. Lord, you know what needs to be done. Holy Ghost, work in us. We turn it over to you and we ask, Lord, that you have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.